Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a global pandemic experience. I have to let you know that ABC TV is filming this, and the questions that you ask uh, may be repeated, uh, not necessarily you asking them, but the questions themselves, um, on the show Life Matters. So uh, let us know if you have a problem with that. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, whose lands we meet upon. And this session is brought to you by Integrated Systems for Epidemic Response, which is an NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence in Epidemic Response. Uh, we're going to make this interactive and allow you to vote and um, show us what you think about various questions. So all you need to do is go onto that website up there. You can also text, but it's a bit slower with the text, so it's better if you go on, use the Wi-Fi. There's free conference Wi-Fi. Uh, I think it's M, M2, M Connect, M Connect. Go on to the M Connect network, and then you can go onto this website. And uh, when we bring up the poll, polling software, you can just vote on your smartphone. So I'll give you a moment to do that. So let's just test out the polling software when you've got it up on your phone. Has anyone got it up on the phone already? Hands up. Okay, a few people. You can test out with this question, which is uh, telling us where you're from. Might call up uh, my colleague Dylan Adam here, who's, who will tell you a little bit about how to use the software. Right, so the, <clears throat> so the easiest way is just through the website, obviously, and on each slide you'll be able to see the website. Um, if you did prefer an alternative, you can actually download an app and follow the same um, connection. It seems to be working. Most from Australia, New Zealand. England, America, Mexico. Okay, so if you've got that, you, there's also a little slip of paper you were given at the door. You can also use that. That's got the web link on it. Okay, and this is just showing us the, uh, what you've filled in, showing us that it's working. So this is, <coughs> so this is another question if you want to go back. So another question just to test things out. Mm. How do you feel about the current level of funding for pandemic preparedness? Do you think it should be increased by a lot, increased a little, and so on? Just fill in your response. This is just to test out the app and that you're comfortable using, with it, using it. Okay. So welcome to a global pandemic experience brought to you by Integrated Systems for Epidemic Response. Now close your eyes just for a minute and transport yourself to a different world, a world called Mendona. Imagine yourself in this country. It's got a population of 60.2 million, so bigger than Australia, but smaller than Germany. The capital city is Megopolis. The national language is Mendolish, and it's a constitutional monarchy. There's very big cities in Mendona. Here's a map which shows you it's got both land and sea borders and two bordering countries of Cyborgia and Olderland. The primary industries are agriculture and farming and the main exports are wheat, dairy and poultry. I'd like to introduce you to the panel, who are all public health experts and uh, you know, leaders in their field. We have, starting at the other end there, Associate Professor Martin Kirk, who's an epidemiologist, infectious disease expert, and director of the Master of Applied Epidemiology, Australia's own field epidemiology training program at ANU. Next to him is Associate Professor David Heslop from UNSW, who's a military medicine and disaster medicine expert. 
Next to him is Dr. Abra Chugtai, who's an infectious disease epidemiologist. Next to him is Professor Obi Aginam from the United Nations University, who's a lawyer and a legal scholar and was involved in the revision of the fifth, fifth revision of the International Health Regulations. Next to him is Dr. David Muscatello, who's an influenza epidemiologist with a long history of working in government. And next to him is Dr. Professor Michael Baker from the University of Otago, who is a leading infectious disease public health expert. Next to him, Professor Bill Rawlinson. Raise your hands, guys, as I call your names out, who is a virologist and infectious disease expert from UNSW and uh, SEALS Laboratory. Next to him is Professor Archie Clements, a veterinarian by training, infectious disease epidemiologist, and uh, head of the School of Rural... Uh, of, um, Population Health at uh, ANU. And next to him is Dylan Adam, who's an epidemiologist. So just so that you know that the roles they're playing, you know, they are drawing on some substantial expertise. Now in Mendona, we have one Nobel laureate. He is Professor R. Bilski. Raise your hand, Professor Bilski, who won the Nobel Prize 10 years ago. <laughs> we have Crown Prince Clement, who is the constitutional monarch of Mendona. Raise your hand, Crown Prince. He's also a veterinarian by training. Then we have Minister Backer, who is Mendona's Minister for Health and has a PhD in geology. He knows a lot about rocks. And he relies heavily on Adam the epidemiologist, who's done the field epidemiology training and knows a lot about outbreaks. Then we have Dr. Muskie, who's the Chief Health Officer. He thinks infectious diseases are highly overrated and that the real epidemic is diabetes. Now, Minister Backer um, has invested a lot into these epidemics of diabetes, of ice, of cancer, and various other things. And, you know, Dr. Adam tries to explain to him that these are actually not epidemics, they're endemic diseases, but he loves talking to the media about epidemics. So Adam's graphs make no difference to him. Here we have General Lopez, who's the chief of the armed forces. He's a tough nut, also known as Smiling Death. And we have Chief Chuggy, who's the chief of police. He doesn't get on with General Lopez. The, in the Mendona Federal Police, we have Alex Papulia, who's Chief Chuggy's representative on the National Biosecurity Task Force, and he reports to Deputy Commissioner Jim Brown. Uh, he's in charge of bioterrorism, and his job is to identify bioterrorism. His colleagues who are dealing with real terrorism think he's a bit of a joke. <laughs> Thank you. In terms of the media, we've got the mainstream media, which is Sox News, the one that others follow. Can we have the full screen, please? And then we have Propaganda Wars, which is a uh, site for your alternative facts and real news. Megan Jelly is the most feared investigative journalist on Sox News. And conspiracy blogger V for Verk, whose real name is Martin Verk, is a billionaire software developer and the founder of Propaganda Wars, an alt-right YouTube news channel. And of course, when the going gets tough, we turn to the GDPO, the Global Disease Prevention Organization, led by Dr. Hakim Bigchot, who's the Director General. Day zero. It's July the 1st. There's reports of highly pathogenic avian influenza affecting farmed and domestic poultry in the neighboring country of Cyborgia. Over five million birds have been culled to control the disease. 
Similar avian outbreaks are reported in Europe, North America and Asia, and a few farms are affected in Mendona. Senator Dick Huge is a country farmer by, in origin and a strong advocate for rural communities and is calling for protection of farmers in Mendona. He's also running for Prime Minister soon and leads a popular emerging force in politics called Rights for Whites. Crown Prince, Prince Clement is quick to respond. I'm sure Minister Thacker will reassure you, but I do know something about bird flu. We've seen it all over the world recently, even in Europe and the United States. No pandemic has resulted. Bird flu only affects birds. Please don't panic. No humans are sick. Our Ministry of Agriculture has it under control. Minister Backer off the record to the Minister for Agriculture. Our Crown Prince should stick to gallery openings and galas. He always wants to button about One Health. Yeah, I wish he'd just check with me before speaking to the media, says the Minister for Agriculture. The Global Disease Prevention Organisation turns to Twitter to calm a nervous public, but the internet is not without its sceptics. You can read there the tweets from the GDPO, which is reassuring the public that everything's under control. And then we have V for Work disagreeing. GDPO says don't panic, but in bed with Big Pharma, bird flu, hashtag pandemic coming, check out www.thetruth.org. V for Work is quick to reach out to his followers online via his infamous vlog. vlog. We hear nothing from our government. And do we think we can trust Dr Big Shot? I don't think so. They say don't panic. Well then why do we see all the bread disappearing from the shelves? And I noticed the other day on my walking to work that there was queues outside the gun shop. That really concerns me. Obviously the things we need to do is we need to think about restrictions, not just of immigration into Mendona. We need to be thinking about how we actually stop people coming in at all. We should be shutting down our airports. We should be closing all of our outside access. And it's time for the government to step up to the microphone. So I'm calling on you, Prince Clement, and I'm calling on you, Dr. Backer, to actually do what you were supposed to do as leaders of our country. It really makes me think that I should actually step up and do it for you. Hmm, I wonder what he has in mind. Day 33. It's August the 2nd, and over 200,000 birds have been culled in Mendona. There have also been 10 cases of sporadic zoonotic transmission to humans all of whom were poultry workers, and seven of those 10 people have died. The GDPO has sent teams to support in-country investigations, and they reassure the world that there's no human-to-human -human transmission, and that this is simply avian influenza with sporadic human cases. The focus must be on culling birds and controlling the risk in poultry, says the World Animal Health Organization, WAHO. Egg prices, meanwhile, are soaring as the poultry industry is hard hit and demanding compensation from the government. Free range is banned and animal activists protest. Of course, the reason that free range is banned is that this is how avian influenza can generate a pandemic. It starts in the wild birds. The wild birds then infect domestic birds, including free range, as opposed to the birds locked up in a battery. Uh, and they can also infect animals, such as pigs and horses, and in areas where you get a lot of mixing between humans and livestock, you can get genetic exchange of material and the generation of a new pandemic strain that's transmissible between people. A press conference is called to confront the growing media anxiety. Now, we're going to offer prizes for the best questions. And we have uh, you know, one of our team here, Chow Bui, who is uh, writing down the questions. And you're going to vote on these questions. Uh, and we'll be giving out some prizes at the end. So, you are now the press gallery, okay? You will join myself and V for Verk in the press gallery asking questions of our panel. 
which is here. So we've got avian influenza, a few human cases, no human-to-human -human transmission, a lot of birds being culled, and egg prices are soaring. And I'm now Megan Jelly. <laughs> I'll start with the questions. Prince Clement, you're a veterinarian. Are we worried about a pandemic here? I mean, there's 10 people who've become infected with this serious type of influenza, and seven of them have actually died. Well, I was a veterinarian, obviously, um, prior to the People's Revolution that uh, installed me, um, prior to all of those news polls, of course. And I would like to say that there's never been a better time to be a Mendonian. Um, however, of course, I'm very, very concerned about um, the loss of, of the lives of a number of our um, poultry workers. Um, but I would like to say that this is not uh, a generalised epidemic in the population. It's really con uh, constrained to animals and people who work with animals. So um, I, I really want to urge uh, people to be uh, not to worry too much at this stage. What about my colleagues out there in the press gallery? Come on, you've got some questions, surely. Yes. We got a microphone? Oh, sorry, up the top there and then another one down here. Hi, have you had any cases of human to human transmission yet? That might be one for Minister Backer. Uh, yes, I, actually, I will pass it on to Dr. Muskie, the Chief Health Officer, who has been uh, liaising with his veterinary colleagues. Thank you, Minister Backer. Um, my understanding is that there are no human to human cases of transmission yet. The disease is only in chickens. But uh, we are very concerned about diabetes in chickens. I've got a question about how you're controlling this. Are you testing all the facilities that are actually um, chicken farms within your country? Are you checking all the workers and the, and the farms? Well, look, I'd like to respond to that. The, um, certainly the uh, Department of Agriculture in Mendona is um, uh, being resourced to test chickens and they're doing that using uh, nucleic acid testing. Uh, certainly in humans, um, our testing has been based upon uh, the old sequences that we have and we're currently sequencing the new virus. Question up there, another one there. Okay. Thanks, I've got the mic. You said there's no human-to-human -human transmission. What have you done to demonstrate that that hasn't occurred? Have you done any surveillance in the families of the poultry workers who've died? This is a terrible disease for families to be exposed to. Uh, Dr. Dr. Muskie, yes, that's one for you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we have done a seroprevalence survey among contacts of the cases, and while we were at it, we took their blood sugar levels. <laughs> uh, hi, yeah, I'd like to know, in the case that human-to-human -human transmission does uh, occur, what have you done to ensure that the health system is prepared uh, for, a, for an epidemic or pandemic? Uh, well, that's probably one for me. Well, the, as you know, the health system has had many um, uh, trial exercises to, um, so they're, they're well prepared for this kind of scenario. They have, they have very thick plans. I've got a question for Dr. Big Shot. Uh, Dr. Big Shot, can you tell us if other countries in the region have had similar clusters of disease and does this constitute a public health event of international concern? At this point, based on the uh, reports from the field investigations that we sent to Mendona, um, I cannot confirm uh, if there are clusters of such events in neighboring countries. Dr. Big Shot, Megan Jelly, Sox News. There's actually a terrible epidemic going on in Cyborgia. Haven't you given lots of resources to them and nothing yet to Mendona? I'm looking at the, the regulations that we have and working with member states, I'm going to convene uh, a meeting of um, the emergency committee to, before I come up with the recommendations on that. Any other questions in the press gallery? Yeah, I was just wondering if His Royal Highness will be visiting the poultry farms and maybe these affected families to show support and solidarity uh, and to um, demonstrate that there's been no transmission from human to human. Absolutely, as I said, uh, there's no, been no demonstrated transmission between um, people and I'd be very happy to visit my subjects in um, the rural regions of my realm.
Well, I'm a very big fan of the, the late um, Princess Diana, and of course I'll follow her lead and give them all a big hug and shake their hands, and probably use um, alcohol rub afterwards. Okay, got some questions up there. For Minister Barker, what are you doing to control this uh, epidemic in the poultry, in the contacts, and what communication are you doing to the rest of the population of Mandona? Yes, well, we're seeing this very much as an occupational health problem in uh, the, the poultry workers. So at this stage, it's not a generalised issue that the whole public needs to be concerned about. And so the, the Ministry of Primary Industries is, is, um, is pursuing that um, education strategy. OK, thank you, Press Gallery. We're calling a close to this conference for now. We've got urgent business to attend to in controlling this epidemic in birds. So we have a question for you. If you can pull out your mobile devices and have a look at this question. Please rank your favourite audience questions to win prizes. Well, we haven't done this yet. This has to come at the end, right? OK, so for each press conference, we, we've listed here the questions people asked. People asked, rank your favourite questions. Not the ones from myself and V for Verk, but the audience questions. What slide is something else? It's the next question, I think. That one. Okay. Okay, what, should we do a show of hands for these questions? Oh, it's working. It's working? Yeah. Do you want to go forward or? It's working. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, looks like we have a winner. Would, Would you, you shake the public's hand? Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Who was that? Okay, just remember you've got a prize to collect at the end. Or well, maybe, maybe Chow can come up and give you your prize. Or oh, is it changing? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, we've had a late change. Are people allowed to vote twice? <gasps> Two equal first. That's a problem. Okay, okay. It's changing again. Well, we better just give this prize. Who are you testing all the poultry farm and workers? Let's just, who's that? Hands up. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on before this becomes controversial. More controversial. Okay, the next question. Do you think Dr. Backer's level of concern of this outbreak should be no concern at all, slight concern, moderate concern, high concern, or everyone, extreme concern? Okay, thank you. Please cast your votes. We'll review all of this at the end. Okay, it's August the 15th, and the GDPO has analysed the virus and determined that it's a new genetic reassortment of an influenza strain uh, that has caused some clusters of human-to-human -human transmission. Um, and uh, they've also confirmed clusters of cases in rural Mendona and there's mass culling of birds in the farms. Now, the egg prices in Mendona, which imports 50% of its eggs, have soared, and the farmers are extremely upset. Dr. Hardy, what can you tell us about the flu outbreak? Well, I'll say what I said this morning. The most likely cause is severe flu. So please just take precautions, rest, see a doctor if you need to. Okay, that was Alex back in the office. So, human cases of severe influenza are now on the rise and work absenteeism is starting to be noticeable. Hospitals are beginning to see a surge in emergency presentations. Professor Bilski has characterised the virus in his lab as an H3N2 with severe antigenic drift and genetic sequences from the bird strain, which was H5N2. Could this be another pandemic like 2009? Bilski tells Backer, 
that this year's seasonal vaccine will not cover this novel strain and result in a high fatality rate. Dr. Backer consults with Dr. Big Shot, who remains ambivalent and uh, thinks this could be just seasonal flu, doesn't want to make any public announcements as yet. But the public is agitated and is taking to Twitter to talk about it. Here's uh, Horace Wimp talking about three people dying in border town and the zombie apocalypse. And then Dr. Big Shot and Minister Backer meet in private to discuss the situation. So Dr. Big Shot, we, we really need your advice on this um, situation in Mendona. Whatever advice I have to give, it will be based on the recommendations of the emergency committee, uh, which would uh, meet very soon to, uh, to assess the situation. Yes, so, but what is your personal view about the situation based on the evidence we've presented? We don't make use of evidence in the public. You know, we send our field investigators and they come back to me, and uh, so I have to base my uh, recommendations based on scientific evidence from our field investigators. So when is the emergency committee meeting? I've uh, sent out uh, messages you know, to uh, constitute this committee and uh, we're waiting for their response. So what do you want to do, arrest the flu? I want to bring someone in who could identify whether this even is the flu. Well, the sniffles don't go away. Why was I put in charge of disease control and bioterrorism if no one is going to take me seriously? No, it presents just as big a threat as bombings or rogue gunmen. Bigger. I tell you what, why don't you keep an eye on things? And in the meantime, I'll promise to wash my hands and cover my mouth if I cough. Okay? Poor Alex. Okay, another question. During the early outbreak, resources are limited. So, what would you invest in? Additional vaccines, additional antiviruses, antivirals, additional respirators, or health promotion? Oh, lots of fans of health promotion here. Concerns are mounting as the number of cases traced back to airports and docks increase. Do you? Do nothing. Implement thermal scanners at the airport. Close international flights, only for domestic flights. Close all commercial travel, leaving industry lanes open. Or close the borders entirely. Thermal scanners seem very popular. Okay. Travel as a vector. A packed flight from the neighboring country of Cyborgia, which is experiencing a much worse epidemic, remember, is quarantined at the airport because a sick passenger with a flu-like illness collapses mid-flight. The patient dies in an ambulance en route to hospital. Contact tracing is initiated. Passengers recall the deceased coughing extensively during the flight. Meanwhile, a group of illegal entrants across the border from Cyborgia are detained and several are ill with the flu. Megan Jelly reports that the US and the UK are using thermoscanners at airports to protect their people. Do you think that thermoscanners are highly effective at detecting cases of potential flu, moderately effective, somewhat effective or ineffective? Bit of a mixed view here. They were very popular though in the last question. Mm -hmm. Contradictory. Okay, we now have uh, Bill Rawlinson also playing the Prime Minister. Chico Ricardo, also known as Chico Rico. I need something back. Elections are in three months. What about those temperature scanners? Sir, influenza has a period of pre-symptomatic transmission. Thermo scanners Just won't work. Do it, Backer. I need to be seen to be doing something. Meanwhile, Senator Dick Huge demands that the PM close the borders and stop illegal immigrants from entering. 
Mendona's northwest border, where several crossings are possible across the mountains and a river. He demands that the government builds a wall. And the Twitter sphere seems to agree. His party, Rights for Whites, is gaining a lot of popularity and so is his bid to be Prime Minister. What about a wall? That moron Hughes is creating panic and people are asking for a wall. His Right for Whites party is gaining on me in the polls. As people seem to like his rhetoric, how quickly can we build it? Can we get someone else to pay? What's that, Backer? It's not in your portfolio to build walls. Well, get me the Minister for Housing and Infrastructure. Megan Jelly, Sox News, reporting from the Mendona Northern border. As you can see, the river behind me looks idyllic. Who would know there's a pandemic going on and thousands of refugees trying to get across any way they can by boats, by swimming, by all means possible, these desperate people try to come into our country. Many of them could be sick with this disease, influenza. Of course, the Premier, Mr Dick Huge, wants to build a wall right here on the banks of the river to keep out the hordes of illegal immigrants. Stopping the boats wasn't enough. Megan Jelly, Sox News. Of course, Megan Jelly's camera crew have all perished from influenza, so she's had to use her home studio. <laughs> Alex. Oh, shit. Nice to see you too. Well, you came halfway across the city with good news. Hospitals are filling up, but that's not why I'm here. We initially saw the spread originating from one place, Mendona Primary School. Makes sense. But looking closer, there are multiple origins. Well, there's, so there's no common no link? No common link between the clusters. Terrorism. Well, let's not jump to any conclusions. It could still be undetected chains of transmission. It could still be the flu. But people are dying. Well, people die from the flu. OK, incubation period, two to seven days, fever, chills, body aches, shortness of breath, coughing, still symptoms of severe flu. I don't think it's... What? What's wrong? It's a death toll update. It's bigger than I thought. Day 89. So it's late September and there are now many suspected cases of the disease in Mendona. Nationally, there are several areas of widespread activity and there's been cases reported in all 20 states. Doctors for Life, DLF, an NGO specialising in refugee and humanitarian medical operations demands that the GDPO declare a public health emergency of global concern, but this is ignored. The case fatality rate is estimated to be about 25%. Some local government jurisdictions have uh, preemptively closed schools and cancelled community events. Dr Big Shot is reluctant to call a pandemic. The outbreak of influenza is ongoing with confirmed cases of human-to-human -human transmission now in various countries with the mor mortality rate far higher than seasonal flu which is you know, usually like 0.0001%. And um, it's now come down to 15%, which is similar to SARS. Two of Mendona's neighbouring countries are also reporting high numbers of influenza cases with overwhelming epidemics in Cyborgia. There's also a confirmed cluster of cases in a rural town of Mendona and suspected clusters are now occurring in Rock Hall. According to the GDPO, this is phase five of a pandemic, which is equivalent to the standby phase, V for Virk. Standby? Are you kidding me? People are dying. Looks like phase SHTF to me. So those of you who are not Australian might have to ask your Australian colleagues what that means. Okay, we have another question. At this stage, should the GDPO declare a pandemic Phase six, that's a fully fledged pandemic. 100% yes. Well, Dr. Big Shot doesn't agree. Okay. Dr. Backer convenes a meeting to discuss the situation and consider the escalating pandemic stage in, Men escalating the pandemic stage in Mendona. 
Dr. Muskie reminds him that the national emergency stockpile can only be used during phase six. Dr. Bilski and Dr. Muskie are in favor of stepping up to the action phase while Dr. Big Shot, Director General, is reluctant to declare a phase six pandemic. So a press conference is called. Okay, over to the press gallery. Your chance to win a prize by asking a good question. I'll start off. V for Verk from Propaganda Wars. I'm interested, Dr. Bilski, if the virus has any characteristics which are unusual. Was it manufactured? Does it have any characteristics of more virulence than you would expect for a routine recombinant strain? We have no evidence this is a, a manufactured um, uh, virus. The recombination that influenza undertakes uh, between animal and human strains has almost certainly been the cause of this pandemic strain and we have a lot of sequence information now that confirms that. It, is, uh, it is certainly does demonstrate some unusual virulence characteristics in cell culture in the laboratory but that's not a feature of manufactured virus. We think this is a naturally occurring recombinant. Okay, we have two questions down there. Is this disease affecting a particular demographic? Dr. Muskie? Yes, I can assure you that um, working age people are the most, uh, and uh, particularly men who are smokers, are the ones who are getting affected. And diabetics? Um, diabetics are okay at the moment, and we've made absolutely sure of that. A question for Dr. Big Shot. Uh, are you currently residing in the country and based on your answer, do you think that has anything to do with your stance at the moment? No, I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm presently in Geneva, but I, um, I've sent a field epidemiologists, and uh, whatever advice I give uh, is based on their scientific advice to me. There's another question in the press gallery. Okay, Dr. Backer, Megan Jelly, Sox News. I can see that Dr. Big Shot won't call a pandemic, but people are dying in Mendona, and to me it seems like a pandemic. Now, are you going to just go along with what he says, or are you going to be decisive and call your own phase six pandemic? We are, of course, taking prudent precautions, health promotion, and so on, but in the end, we are tied by international law to follow the GDPO's ruling on this, and we are waiting with um, some concern now for the opinion of the emergency committee. Dr. Big Shot. Unfortunately, the, um, the powers that I have as a DG was given to me by member states, and I have to wait for the emergency committee to, to advise me. Okay, we have some more questions in the press gallery. Two questions there. Can you tell me how many healthcare workers have been affected and what are you doing to um, protect them? Dr. Muskie. Thank you, Dr. Backer. We, um, we are um, delivering what personal protective equipment we do have available uh, to all our healthcare workers, but uh, I'm afraid we're having to um, sp uh, split our supplies with uh, the uh, army of, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Lopez uh, has, uh, has taken some of the uh, pr personal protective equipment by force. Uh, there was another question, yeah? No, one up the back, and there's one further forward as well. Um, not sure who to direct this to, but um, have you got a test for this, and uh, are you finding that people who are being sick uh, and dying do actually have the pandemic strain? I'd be happy to answer that. Yes, we have a nucleic acid test. It's based around um, in-house PCR and just working up the quality assurance program nationally throughout uh, the Mendona reference laboratories and uh, as this is an H3 recombinant it um, tends to multiply more rapidly than other viruses and so we're seeing a lot of virus particularly in children. So high teeters, easy to detect at the moment. There's another question. Yeah. At which stage do you think um, health concerns will outweigh economic concerns in Mendovia? 
So that'll uh, force you to force your hand to maybe call a quarantine. Dr. Yes. Maskey, I think you're the expert on quarantine, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, Dr. Backer is in a position to answer the economic side of that, and I think he'd, he'd give a much more balanced view. Yes, at this stage, we feel it would be far too serious to our economy to shut the borders entirely. Um, so that's a very, would have very serious consequences for the entire country if we did that. Prince Clements, it's V for Verk from Propaganda Wars. It's been a very enlightening press conference. And I'm wondering, do you have full confidence in your government that they know what's going on? I see your Minister for Health and your Chief Health Officer trading questions. Can you give me some insight to the stability of government? Oh yes, don't you worry about that. Um, the whole experience of course has confirmed my long-held belief that really we should um, have been operating a One Health um, approach to all of our uh, disease control and uh, I'm considering at the moment merging our Ministry of Health and our Ministry of Agriculture um, as, as the next step forward in my, in my grand vision. Radical. Just a question around, um, you're running out of PPE equipment um, and protection for your workers. What about your antivirals? What are your antiviral stocks like? Dr. Muskie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, I've, I've been assuring the minister that if we move to pandemic phase six, we can release our stockpiles of insulin and rid this country of diabetes. Are, are the people who really need the antivirals getting them and how quickly are you getting the, the, the antivirals to them? We'd like to see more antivirals for um, the laboratory staff because I'm very concerned we still don't know the transmissibility of um, this H5, H3 recombinant and we're running out of PC3 laboratory space to do the diagnostic so we're having to use PC2+. Plus and I'd like to see some more antivirals released to the laboratories. Give us some more drugs. We're, we're having to ration them um, and on prophylaxis for the laboratory staff who are dealing at PC2 plus level, not at PC3. So the laboratory staff who aren't getting um, uh, the appropriate containment levels. Um, we're trying to prophylax them with the antivirals and we only really have um, about a week left or less. That's something for the health minister to respond Sounds to. Sounds correct to me. I have a lot of concerns that there's a lot of inaction happening here and, and um, I was wondering if there was perhaps a, a larger female representative on the committee there, whether, <laughs> whether there, there may be some more decisive action to um, like save people's lives maybe. Excellent point, excellent point. Where's the gender balance in Mendona? There's a serious problem, right? You've got a lot of high powered people there working on this problem, but have you worked out what the reproduction rate of this virus is yet? It's approximately two. Okay, we're going to close this press conference now and move on, and we'll take the R0 to be two for this virus. Okay, the poll seems to have uh, dropped out, but maybe at the end we can vote on that question. I think we've taken notes on what the questions were. <laughs> This is Megan Jelly reporting from New York, which has been very hard hit by the pandemic. It's understood that the Director General of the GDPO, Dr. Hakim Bigshot, is holed up inside the UN building right now. We're waiting to see if he's going to call a pandemic. The whole world seems to agree there is a pandemic going on, only Dr. Bigshot refuses to call it. Let's see, shall we? whether he comes out and declares a pandemic. Megan Jelly, Sox News. So meanwhile, there's a problem with diagnostic services. There's a reluctance of scientists in the lab to handle specimens of unknown pathogenicity, 
scientists' absenteeism is increasing, the PC3 facilities are overrun, and Professor Bilski is pleading with the government for more resources. Professor Bilski. It's important to realise that at the same time, of course, because it's winter in Mendona, we're seeing uh, circulation of other viruses causing very similar syndromes but less uh, mortality. We're still seeing circulation of uh, H1 and H3 non-recombinant influenzas, and we've recently had an, out, uh, an outbreak within our paediatric population of respiratory syncytial virus. So we need to continue our routine testing at the same time. New laboratory facilities are open for the use of the elite testing team. Thank you. So, what's the likely positive predictive value of a clinical case definition during an epidemic? Is it going to be 0 to 25%, 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, or 75 to 100%? The positive predictive value during an epidemic. B seems very popular. Oh, C is rising. Oh, C is overtaken B. Very good. So, Dr. Backer and Dylan, Adam, <coughs> discuss the matter. There is not enough diagnostic capacity, Adam. We can't build more labs, and even if we could, we don't have the staff for them. Well, sir, we can use a clinical case definition. During an epidemic, the positive predictive value of a uh, clinical de definition rises. So, where would you take additional money for testing, PPE, and other resources during this pandemic? Cast your votes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yep, hit those tobacco companies. Public hospitals are taking a hit. Okay, interesting spread of votes there. It's a finite pie, right? The money's got to come from somewhere. Like all chief health officers and chief medical officers all over the world, Dr. Muskie gets a crash course in infectious diseases. Adam? What's this R0 thing? Is there an R0 for diabetes? Can we calculate the epidemic threshold for diabetes? The race for a vaccine is on. Crown Prince Clement, who's known as the People's Prince, he's loved among the population, donates <laughs> 20 million for vaccine development through his charity, One Health Global. Future of humanity at stake. Control of pandemic depends on vaccine. $20 million at One Health Global. Okay. Sorry? No, it's to develop a vaccine. And it's a wall, not a fence. <laughs> okay, which measures for control cannot be relied on early in the epidemic? Oh, we have a very smart audience here. Okay, some changing votes. Peer pressure. So, Adam explains this issue of vaccines which are highly in demand. Well, we appreciate the money, uh, Prince Clement, but actually, Your Highness, a matched vaccine won't be ready for another three to six months minimum. Uh, the epidemic would have peaked by then, and we need other control measures, things like antivirals, PP, and social distancing. Okay, so you can see there that by the time you get the vaccine, the epidemic's already peaked. And the only one who seems to know this is Adam, the epidemiologist. What do we do while waiting for the vaccine? PPE and antiviral stockpiles are distributed to hospitals. Rioting has broken out. There's not enough PPE for the armed forces and police. Minister Backer, advised by his best epidemiologist, Adam, wants to close schools and cancel the Beyonce concert and the big soccer game. This is Megan Jelly from Mendona Stadium, where sellout crowds were hoping today 
to see the Mendona Daredevils play Manchester United. Unfortunately, the government has banned all mass gatherings, including the soccer game tonight, so hundreds of thousands of people are wondering how they're going to get a refund on their tickets. Megan Jelly, Sox News. So, by this stage, there's quite a bit of social disruption. The travel, restaurant and entertainment industry is hard hit. People just aren't going out. Theatre owners in the community are concerned about their economic viability if they're ordered to close. Employees of theatres, stadiums and schools are concerned about unfair treatment, citing that large office complexes with thousands of employees are not ordered to close. People are scared, Alex. More are dead. You hear about Frank's wife? People are getting antsy. We're days away from a full-blown riot, so. It's a strain of bird flu, but the lab test shows several genetic mutations, which means it's possibly engineered, but no one's coming forward, so. So? That's all we, that's all I know. So Alex's boss seems to have changed his tune a little bit. Dr. Big Shot authors a New England Journal Medicine publication using data from Mendona, and simultaneously he declares a pandemic. Professor Bilski and Dr. Backer are incensed and refuse to share virus sequences with the GDPO. This means Mendona depends on its own vaccine development. A pandemic is declared. The GDPO finally declares this to be a pandemic, phase six. The DFL condemns the GDPO for its slow response and, uh, and uh, apparent inaction. The disease is now widespread across Mendona. Many local businesses are reporting up to 40% absenteeism, and it's estimated that 40% of the population is infected. The power grid is affected intermittently due to absenteeism. The travel industry is facing near bankruptcy, especially small and medium-sized businesses. Some outrageous things happening lately. That Megan Jelly from Sox News has been propagating false propaganda, fake news everywhere. We've seen General Lofi's pushing his weight around. That said, maybe it is time to get tanks in the streets. We certainly do need something out there to calm down the panic. We can no longer see the Mendona football team play. It's, it's an absolute disgrace. If the government had jumped on this earlier, like I'd said, then we might not be in this situation. If you want to find out more about this, you can go over to my news site propaganda wars but in the meantime watch out for, for my campaign coming up i'm thinking about something big and i'm feeling very presidential so dr big shot announces the gdpr is revising the pandemic phases on the hop they're actually in phase shtf something they had not accounted for previously Countries go into chaos and scramble to revise their own country plans. Another press conference is called to reassure the worried public. Okay, is our press gallery ready to go? Questions from our panel? It's V for Verk, and I'd, I'd really like to ask this question again of Professor Bilski. I know you're a Nobel laureate and very distinguished, but we have heard more rumours that this is an engineered virus, and I really want to understand who would do such a thing, and is there connections with Big Pharma? Can you reassure the public? It's very important to realise that all the mutations we've seen can occur naturally in this virus. It's a virus that naturally makes if you like a lot of mistakes when it's growing and you get these mutations, there's no evidence of a manufactured change to the vaccine. There's every evidence that this is a, a, a virus rather that uh, has changed as part of the events that occur. They're called recombination. It's, it's known as a, a mutations that occur. Megan Jelly, Sox News. Minister Backer. What's happened with the vaccine? You know, we need a vaccine urgently, and I understand uh, Prince Clement, the People's Prince, has given $20 million towards this. Where's the vaccine? Well, unfortunately, if you were more educated in this area, you'd know it takes many months to produce a suitable vaccine. <laughs> 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 
Professor Bilski, do you have something to add to that? A vaccine's a very important way of controlling influenza in the long term, but as we, we know and we've been advising the government all along, it's very important in the early stages to use antivirals and to use uh, uh, health measures uh, that they control, um, hygiene measures, those things to control the transmission because the vaccine is going to take about three to six months. It's going to require a lot of effort, which we're putting in, and it's important in the long term, but in the short term you need those other things. Minister Backer, back to you. Is there a problem with gender balance in the Mendona government? I mean, if there were more women in STEM, wouldn't we have a vaccine by now? Uh, I think we should have more women in the government, but it's quite separate to this particular issue. It's actually a technical problem with vaccine. It doesn't, you just can't whip it up overnight. It takes a few months. Any other questions in the press gallery? I've got one here. Um, with that in mind, uh, what are you doing to, uh, to increase production capacity there? And hasn't it already been some time since that donation was made? Um, so you're not sort of starting at point zero, you're going a little bit further along the zero to six month production time. Certainly, um, uh, I'd like to emphasise we're not downplaying the role of vaccine in the, wrong, in the long term and we have uh, collaborated with the companies to produce vaccine. You'll recall that as part of the GDPO program internationally, we share our viruses, we provide seed viruses, and at that point, um, the vaccine producers take over and use those seed viruses to um, produce vaccines, and we're certainly cooperating not only internationally, but also with the producers. Yes, but Professor Bilski, Mendona is not sharing its sequences with the GDPO any longer. So you're on your own, isn't that so? We think that it's very important to see this as an international problem and that influenza is something spread uh, globally in a very rapid time and we are certainly in negotiation to assist our colleagues not only within Mendona but uh, overseas. Dr Bigshot, V for Verk, what are you doing to repair the damage that you've done with Mendona by publishing sequence information but how, how are you repairing this and not showing favouritism to other member states? We are working to, with all member states to address this. And as you know, um, you know um, situations like this uh, don't respect national borders. So our main goal is to, to build trust between member states and uh, I'm reaching out to the authorities in Mendona to do this. Okay, I have a question for the army and the police. Uh, how are you managing uh, to dispose of bodies and uh, sterilise uh, facilities and make sure that there's no transmission of the disease because of poor handling and la lack of PPE equipment and uh, your staff, protection of your staff? Uh, we're doing our best and uh, but the basically our role is to maintain law and order and uh, we're protecting people, we're protecting health facilities and we're protecting doctors. Um, we are t uh, helping with some other things as well, but uh, of course there is a lack of PPE. Uh, we don't have any, um, very few PPE available to us, so there are some limitations, but definitely we are working our best. Yeah, thanks, Chucky. Put your donut down, mate. Uh, so it's uh, General Lopez here, and um, look, we're, uh, we're managing our own internal um, uh, jobs pretty well as, uh, as the military. At the moment we're at the ready. Uh, to, to maintain national security uh, and ready to be called upon uh, in case the nation needs us. Uh, but we're at the moment focusing mainly on our existing international and national commitments. Uh, that is the national security of Mendona. Any more questions in the press gallery? Yep, we've got one. I understand with the shortage of beds in ICU, they're being taken up by old people, obese people and smokers, and children aren't getting access. Um, how can you let this happen? Surely you must be doing something about rationing? Dr Muskie. <laughs> thank you, Dr Becker. Yes, thank you for the question. We, um, we are concerned that uh, people with diabetes are being kicked out of intensive care units as we speak, and I have to emphasize that that's extremely unfair and uh, where possible we are allocating beds to uh, to uh, 
the people with influenza, and we're trying to uh, uh, we're trying to find other facilities that can uh, spread the load as well. Okay, we might close this press conference now and move on. Okay, uh, the polling software, we have taken down the questions. We'll go back to that at the end, okay? We still do have some prizes to give away. Thank you for your questions. Okay, so what do you think, when do you think closing schools would be most effective during a pandemic? Early, during the peak, or after the peak? Okay. So, schools are closed in an ad hoc fashion initially across some regions and states. Minister Backer wants to close schools nationally. Adam informs him that it's too late. The epidemic seems to be at the peak and school closure to be effective must be done early. He shows Backer the, the research and data that supports this, but Backer wants to close the schools anyway. Adam sighs because he knows his bosses always make these kinds of decisions too late. Parents ask who will look after their children if the schools are closed. So here we have both school closure and vaccines trending on Twitter. We have Horace Wimp asking who's going to look after his kids and V for Verk. Vaccine for the rich, profits for big pharma and for government, hashtag bird flu, hashtag no more lies, hashtag free vaccines. Senator Huge opposes school closure and suggests as an alternative rounding up anti-vaxxers, LGBTQI and religious minorities who live in ghettos and wear funny clothes and don't comply with mainstream practices, he says, and putting them in internment camps with their unvaccinated and uncivilised children as an emergency measure to protect the innocent public. He says this is more publicly acceptable socially than closing schools. And the polls suggest 54% of the population agree with him. What a state of affairs. The Prime Minister. Can we vaccinate everyone with seasonal flu vaccine? Crown's print, Crown Prince Clement called me and said we can. Can we round up all anti-vaxxers and unimmunised people and put them somewhere else? People are angry, they want someone to blame and Huge is getting a lot of support. Okay, I know what I can do to upstage huge. Stop all planes coming in, no more international flights, close the borders now. What? We live in a just-in-time economy. The economy will collapse in two weeks with the borders closed. Well, I'll close the borders for one and a half weeks. I can't let right for whites overtake me in the polls. So the borders are closed by the order of the Prime Minister. Internal travel is still possible, but restricted in some areas. Some cities and towns are implementing complete lockdown, home quarantine and isolation. People are running out of food and breaking quarantine to go out in search of food. Border disputes are occurring between countries testing national and international legislation. A plane departing from Mendona is turned back because of ill passengers. A refugee camp on the southern border of Mendona is closed and the refugees are forced to flee. General Lopez and Chief Chuggy are at loggerheads about management of civil unrest and uh, border disputes. General Lopez, border control is my responsibility. Why are you trying to create trouble? Don't you have wars to fight? Now you listen here, Chuggy. Put your donuts down again, all right? You were in command of the siege of Mendona, right? And that was an unfortunate turn of events, if I, if I recall. Don't you think the army can do it better? And it's in my power to step in. So if you don't play your cards right, I might have to save this country from itself. Ooh. Now, now, General Lopez, you know border control is technically a police matter. Well, sir, your highness, so was the siege of Mendona, and look at how that turned out. You have the power to let me manage it, Prince Clement. So, the army does take over control of the borders. 
Meanwhile, in the hospitals, healthcare workers are ill and dying from pandemic influenza. Some of the staff are staying at the hospital for fear of infecting their loved ones. Exhaustion and mistakes in PPE removal and self-contamination are an increasing problem. This is Megan Jelly for Sox News. It's a very sad occasion as I await the CEO of Mendona Hospital at the boardroom here behind me. He'll be coming out shortly for a press conference on the tragic loss of so many healthcare workers. Just today, the leading infectious diseases doctor, Dr. Jason Bourne, passed away from influenza. And at least 20 nurses have succumbed, as well as 15 other doctors. And there are others still in intensive care in hospital right here in Mendona Hospital. We pray for them and we wish them a speedy recovery. But it leaves me asking the question, how are we going to look after all the sick people in this city when our doctors and nurses are dying of pandemic influenza? Megan Jelly, Sox News. So panic sets in. The matched vaccine is still not ready. There's a limited supply of a pre-pandemic vaccine, which, which is a partial match to the strain, uh, but only 10,000 doses. And rumours circulate that only the wealthy families are receiving the vaccination for payment, that frontline and essential service staff are not receiving access, and that um, tensions are erupting between the different government services. There's also reports of black market value of the dose of a vaccine being $100,000 and reports of blood being sold on the black market as a cure. And there's riots in Megopolis. <coughs> Hospitals are beyond capacity. Cases have to be triaged using standard disaster triaging. So if people are assessed to be uh, likely to die, they are grouped with the deceased uh, for no treatment. Those who are seriously ill or code red requiring intubation will get priority, followed by those with cardio needing cardiorespiratory support. Anyone with moderate or mild illness will be sent for community care or home care. General Lopez begins building field tent hospitals in the community as the health system just can't manage even all the code red cases. And army medics staff the clinic. Minister Backer consults Dr Big Shot about the law. We have a public health act which allows us some actions such as grounding planes and incarcerating recalcitrant patients. But we need to call a state of emergency to deal with rioting. Can you help me with the problem of poor epidemic control in our neighbouring countries? If they could control their disease, it would ease the epi epidemic in Mendona. Yes, Minister, Minister Becker, we, have, we do have uh, the global health laws, and whatever I do as the, as the DG uh, depends on the authorities in, the, in those legislation. Well, big shot, that's a, a toothless tiger. It's not enforceable, and too many countries are not able to comply with them. Do something about it, please. The demand for personal protective equipment has significantly increased, and the national stockpile is depleting. There's an acute shortage of respirators in the Mendona National Laboratory and staff are refusing to work without appropriate protection. Professor Bilski is demanding more PPE for his lab staff and expansion of lab capacity, but the Chief Health Officer, Dr Muskie, is demanding PPE for health workers. Dr Muskie is still learning about pandemics and surge capacity. Minister Backer wonders who he should give priority to, the frontline healthcare workers or the lab staff? And will surgical masks be enough? He just can't afford respirators. So his best epidemiologist, Adam, teaches him about risk analysis and how to make recommendations for personal protective equipment and all the different factors he needs to take into consideration. Tell me everything you know about PPE, Adam. Uh, well, stockpiling is important to provide equipment to all frontline staff and to maintain supply. 
Uh, current regulations for emergencies such as outbreaks only designate enough for two weeks, so prioritization is important. The CDC actually has a program to quickly distribute supplies to 72 major cities that house 57% of the US population. I wish I'd thought of that. Instead, I have General Lopez and Chief Chuggy complaining their troops don't have any PPE. Well, I would suggest other considerations in conjunction with PPE, such as hand hygiene, isolation of infected cases, antivirals, and administrative and environmental measures. Uh, vaccinating for select disease can also be effective, such as the pneumococcal vaccine for secondary bacterial infections. Dr. Backer thinks Adam is due for a promotion after, after the dust settles and all of this. Government assets are generally di dispersed and depleted. The strategic national stockpile has been exhausted because it was only good for two weeks. PPE is in short supply and severe conflicts regarding prioritization of limited supplies are occurring between health, police and border protection. And a senior police officer is sacked for complaining on Facebook. Here's his complaint and his boss telling him to come to the office. Blood on their hands, he says, because they had to control rioting without PPE in the hospital. You got a warrant? I'm getting. Is the unit prepped and ready? They're on their way, but Alex, we couldn't get full protective gear. They said it was a waste of money and unnecessary. Well, what are they got? So Alex isn't having much luck either. We should be following the example of police in Melbourne who are providing PPE to their frontline men and women. They also went back to blue uniform. Nice. <laughs> Chief Chuggy calls a press conference to address the rising tensions between frontline responders. Okay, how's our press gallery doing? So we've got conflict fighting. There we go, a question up there. It'll never happen. V for Verk, I'm just wondering, General Lofis, if you could tell us how troops are actually using PPE at the moment. What are they using? Their caps as face masks? What's going on out there? Well, you, you see, um, my friend, um, look, we uh, very early on in this, um, in this event, we secured a supply of... Um, of uh, strategic supply of PPE uh, because we foresaw that, um, that unfortunately the civilian world would not be able to manage this uh, and that we would have to step in at the border in particular. Uh, so our soldiers uh, are well, well versed with using the, uh, the, the cutting edge PPE and we have sufficient supply to manage that at this, at this stage. Mm. If anyone doesn't like that, it's too bad. Okay, hey, Megan Jelly, Sox News. Chief Chuggy, what are you doing about the lack of PPE for your frontline responders? I mean, they're being called on to control the riots that are happening in the hospitals. Are they prepared to go to work? I've heard that one of them has just been sacked for complaining. Yeah, we are facing a lot of issues because uh, our police officers, they don't have any PPE, and many of them, you know, they died as well. And I heard that some of them, they are just using cloth masks, and you, I don't know that cloth masks are effective or not. I contacted health department as well, and they just sent few medical masks. Uh, I don't think so it, it would work. What about your riot shields? Can you use them? I don't know. I need to ask health department about this. Can I use those? Uh, yes, it's a great idea. You can actually um, protect yourself from large droplets that can contain the virus. Okay, and rocks. Any other questions from the gallery? From our frontline responders, police, defence forces? Yeah. Is there any evidence that 
uh, people who've recovered from the infection uh, are resistant? Do they develop immunity, protective immunity? Is that Professor Matthews? My eyesight's not as good as it used to be. I think it is. Good question. Certainly, the, um, uh, we do our serology and uh, we find uh, they have IgG, which is uh, specific on some of our assays, which are called neutralisation assays. They're specific for the Mendona pandemic strain. So they are certainly achieving some immunity when they recover. V for Verk from Propaganda Wars. I'm interested in the rollout of the vaccine. How's that going? I'd really be interested in a response from the government on that because I haven't seen any in our pharmacy. There's none down at the milk bar down the road. What's going on? Well, Dr Muskie has worked out a very elaborate prioritisation program which you'll now describe. <laughs> yes, um, Thank you. We are, we are giving the vaccine to healthcare workers first as first priority because if we don't protect our healthcare workers, then um, there'll be no one to treat patients when they become sick. Yeah, Megan Jelly Sox News. That's nice, Dr. Muskie, but the vaccine's not actually available yet. So you're planning to give it to healthcare workers, but you know, when, when are we going to actually have this vaccine? Prince Clement. Well, I can assure you that the. Um the young duchesses have all been vaccinated and uh, they're um, not complaining at all about the, uh, the side effects. And um, as for Crown Prince Leopold, he's, uh, his diabetes is doing very well and he's uh, still in the uh, ICU. Thank you. Any other questions in the press gallery? No, if not, we'll move on. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to our polling software. We'll have to... Skip that, we'll do it at the end. So, Crown Prince Clement's funding is helping vaccine development, with which Mendona must do alone without the GDPO after its decision not to share virus strains. Professor Bilski is leading this vaccine development. Accelerated vaccine development has been approved with mixed academic and public reaction. Ethicists are alarmed about the possible harms of rapidly implementing human experimentation and caution that the risks may outweigh the benefits. Leading ethicist Paul Komisarov. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Sarov. The president is suggesting that those who refuse flu vaccine should be quarantined in a special facility. What do you think about this? I'm changing role. For a start, Megan, we don't even have enough vaccine for the population. The seasonal vaccine won't protect against this strain. We also have to think about herd immunity. Everyone doesn't need to be vaccinated for the whole community to be, to be protected. It's unethical to force people to be vaccinated. Vaccination requires informed consent. We can deal with this without being unethical. Okay, well, let's move on, Dr. Sarov. Normally, vaccines go through strict testing protocols. These have been, there's been, uh, you know, these have been abandoned to get a vaccine to us early. No phase three trials, accelerated animal studies. Will this be safe? The government's done this because this is an emergency. Nonetheless, there is a concern about using a vaccine on human beings which is not being properly tested or assessed for safety. The Fort Dick swine flu in the US last century is a good example where normal protocols were bypassed and the vaccine caused various serious harm to people. The Twitter sphere is still active. People are asking about vaccines and V for work. Vaccines for the rich, profits for big pharma and whore government. Hashtag bird flu, hashtag no more lies, hashtag free vaccines. Success at last. The hero of Mendona, Professor Bilski, our Nobel laureate, has finally come up with the vaccine. Six months into the pandemic, a match vaccine is ready to be delivered to the population. There's enough for 50% of the population. To give two doses to 50% of the population, or one dose, which is a half schedule, to 100%. Dr. Sarov advises Dr. Backer it's more ethical to give half dose to everyone. Megan Jelly reporting for Sox News. I'm here at the palace of the Crown Prince of Mendona, Prince Clement. As you know, he very generously donated $20 million towards development of a vaccine. And the news is 
the vaccine is now developed. However, thousands of doctors and nurses at the front line of our hospitals are dying of influenza and have not yet received the vaccine. And I understand that Crown Prince Clement and his family have been vaccinated. So I'm very eager to find out from Crown Prince Prince Clement what his strategy is for equitable distribution of the vaccine to the people of Mendona who are at the front line in this fight. Megan Jelly, Sox News. Is a vaccine even safe? I'm not sure it's going to be useful. When are we actually going to get it? No doubt we'll get it just as the ep epidemic is finishing in Mendona and everybody who is going to die has died. I'm really quite concerned more importantly about the links that Big Pharma has to this. They're the only ones that stand to profit from this whole exercise and it's going to be at the expense of the taxpayer. So Bilski's vaccine is rolled out to ha at half dose to the whole population and he wonders if anyone's ever won the Nobel Prize twice. That should be a polling question. Mendona's health system has been decimated. Many healthcare workers have uh, entirely uh, been absent or have perished. And other frontline responders similarly, a military, police, paramedics. Uh, some areas now have no effective healthcare system and the DFL has joined the army to set up more tent hospitals in these areas uh, to help with the situation. General Lopez and Chief Chuggy have divided their responsibilities amicably and have actually had a beer together today. The death toll is much higher than expected. Morgues are full and dead body management has become an issue. Waste transport companies are refusing to transport hospital waste. Cleaners are on strike because of lack of PPE. Dr. Backer prioritises supplies and vaccines for health workers, police, military, hospital ancillary staff, including cleaners. Dr. Big Shot extends the olive branch and apologises and holds reconciliation talks with Mendona and a more collaborative approach is agreed on. Virus strains will be shared again and Mendona scientists will have the opportunity to co-author any New England Journal publications with, which, with the GDPO. Another six months later, cases are declining. The vaccine's begun to have an impact on the epidemic and there's hope in Mendona. Prince Clement. Mendona Medical Research is number one. Hashtag vaccine for all. Hashtag at Bilski, at Paul Sarov, at GDPO. The People's Prince, His Royal Highness Clement. Vaccines for all, Mendona. Anyway, I just wanted to stop by and say good work. It's a shame it took an emergency to get us working together. Off the record. It's always off the record. I gotta go. How's everything going at the department? Uh, administering the vaccine, counting the dead. I'm still technically on sick leave. We should grab a coffee, catch up. <laughs> we'll see. So schools and critical infrastructure gradually commence functions again. V for Work's popularity has soared. And following uh, all of this, he's announced that he's uh, going to run for Prime Minister and the following of his propaganda wars site triples. Copycats of V for Work spring up everywhere. I'm going to expose corruption and transform the country. Here's all the copycats of V for Work tweeting. And in breaking news, V for Work on his Propaganda Wars site breaks the news of serious corruption, money laundering and criminal activity on the part of Senator Huge. Remember him? Huge's close friend, the head of the anti-corruption agency, issues a report that exonerates him. But Meg and Jelly, strange bedfellows, teams up with V for Work and investigates the story, confirms it. A royal commission into political corruption is held and Huge receives a suspended sentence of one year community service and vows to return and clear his name. The recovery phase. The first wave of disease has passed and it's expected that there will be an additional wave of illness which may or may not be as severe as the first wave. So the government 
reviews the resources which have been mobilised and how to redeploy them and how to re recommence operations that have been suspended. It's quite a sort of complex staged process and the Minister for Finance needs to look at where he's going to recover uh, costs from. He, because there's no gender balance in the Mendona government, they're all <laughs> men. <laughs> and um, he's looking at a recovery levy tax on the people of Mendona. Long-term issues that have become apparent include mental health and grief, for, grief counselling for people who have lost loved ones, as well as um, looking at uh, community containment measures and scaling them back and economic recovery. So, multi-agency meetings are held to try and sort through these issues and Prince Clement, who's a very clever man, rallies corporations to see how the public private sector can partner with the public sector to contribute to recovery. And here's some tweets from Prince Clement. Um, Mendona, hashtag vaccine saves lives, hashtag hero at Bilski. New blog, big farmers in bed with the feds, experimenting on you, hashtag bird flu, hashtag truth, hashtag Mengele. Delete your account, V for work. So the credits for this scenario, Professor Bilski, Professor Bill Rawlinson from UNSW, Prince Clement, Professor Archie Clements from ANU, General Lopez, Associate Professor David Heslop from UNSW, Minister Backer, Professor Michael Baker from the University of Otago in New Zealand, Adam the Epidemiologist, Dylan Adam from UNSW, Paul Komisarov, Professor Paul Komisarov from Monash University, who's part of our Centre for Research Excellence but not here today. Uh, Megan Jelly, myself, Rhina McIntyre from UNSW. Dr. Muskie, Dr. David Muscatello, Dr. Hakim Bigshot, Professor Obi Aginam from the United Nations University. V for Work, Associate Professor Martin Kirk from ANU. Chief Chuggy, Dr. Abra Chugtai from UNSW. So just to reflect on this, pandemics are disasters and require a disaster response. The scenario was designed to entertain and engage and all the characters and settings are fictitious. However, we draw on realistic um, sort of uh, realistic issues to um, populate those scenarios from past pan epidemics. There are recurrent common themes, particularly predictable human responses and societal impacts arising from crises and disasters. For example, in the US, uh, they've had uh, problems with avian influenza epidemics, which have had quite an impact on the poultry industry in 2015 and in 2016. Uh, during the Ebola epidemic, blood was sold on the black market as a cure, and it caused uh, a lot of concern about the, you know, the hazards of such practices. Indonesia did withhold um, uh, avian influenza viruses from the WHO in 2008, and that's another interesting story about why that occurred. The need for military intervention was seen during the Ebola epidemic in 2014 and has been seen in other serious epidemics, police and law enforcement responses as well. This picture is from the single case of Ebola at Dallas Presbyterian Hospital where you see the waste disposal person walking through in their full PPE next to the police officers who are not wearing any PPE. So it just raises that point of frontline responders and the neglected dimension of some of those responders. And of course, PPE became very, very controversial during the Ebola epidemic. And there were guidelines that changed halfway through the epidemic. Uh, in terms of Sierra Leone had lockdown, where people actually were forced to stay in their homes, were not allowed to go out even for food or water, and that caused you know, a lot of problems and potentially deaths as well. Uh, the WHO and many countries have changed their pandemic phases. Even in Australia, we had to change the pandemic phases in 2009 because the plans didn't actually reflect what was happening at the time. 
Waste disposal uh, can be a major problem. In uh, Ebola, we had waste companies refusing to transport waste, problems with bur safe burials, and so on. And vaccines, while well, the anti-vaccine movement has been around since Edward Jenner and the smallpox vaccine, um, and uh, there's always controversy around vaccines. And the Fort Dix incident, which was mentioned, uh, was what well, thought to be a, a, an emergent pandemic. Uh, the vaccine was rushed through and caused quite serious, you know, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and uh, no pandemic actually occurred. So in that instance, the rushing through of the vaccine was detrimental. And of course, these days, we don't just have mainstream news, we have many different sources of news. People are not, um, you know, uh, news, news is available from many different sources with many different spins on, on uh, you know, facts. This is a graph from uh, a paper published in the New England Journal last year which shows that actually there have been an increasing number of serious epidemics occurring clustered in time recently compared to any time in the past. So something is changing. There's more and more of these epidemics occurring. Here's a paper uh, published by Chow Bui, who's sitting up here at the front, showing avian influenza viruses infecting humans that have emerged uh, in history. And from 1918 to 1957, there was nothing. And yet in the last five years, we've had seven new viruses emerging. So again, you're seeing this clustering in time many more of these viruses emerging, which increases the risk of a pandemic. Patterns of disease, just to mention, uh, you know, there are, we hear the word epidemic used widely for almost anything, um, but, uh, you know, epidemic generally refers to something that has very rapid rise in cases, a peak and a fall uh, over weeks to days, and um, causes so, uh, uh, stress on the health system and requires surge capacity. So chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, drug addiction, obesity, cancer, often referred to as epidemic, but they're serious endemic diseases, they're not epidemic diseases. As an example here, you can see the rise in diabetes rates in uh, low and middle income and high income countries, and it's very gradual, it's over decades, it's not over even months. So this is an endemic disease still. Whereas this is a classic epidemic curve, which is Ebola in 2014. Very sharp rise over a matter of weeks, a peak, and then a fall over a matter of months. So in terms of health protection, uh, we have which is legislation for public health. We have some global uh, tools, such as the IHR, uh, the Cartagena Protocol, and the Biological Weapons Convention. And then countries have things like public health and quarantine acts. I'll hand over to Dr. Aginam, who's an expert on uh, public health law, who'll talk a little bit about international health regulations. Yes, uh, thank you, Raina. Um, the um, IHR um, remains the only uh, international, or if you like, global um, set of regulations uh, used by the WHO for, um, um, uh, for surveillance and control of um, transnational spread of, uh, uh, of uh, infectious diseases. It's something that is as old as WHO itself, but um, uh, it hasn't been very well enforced you know, in the past. So after SARS, after the SARS outbreak, the WHO um, started a process you know, uh, based on the lessons learned from SARS and um, got the IHR revised and agreed by the 194 member states in 2005. Um, and everybody was happy, you know, that, um, you know, the IHR has now been considerably revised. Uh, but um, then we were hit by Ebola, and um, um, the WHO was supposed to use uh, the international health regulations um, in a much more proactive way. Uh, but it, it didn't, you know, because uh, it took uh, almost six months or thereabouts before the, the DG or WHO could declare Ebola uh, a public health emergency of international concern. So the, if you read all the reviews that have been done about um, on lessons from Ebola, uh, WHO was, um, you know, criticized for acting so slowly and for uh, actually, you know, um, uh, doing what it should do under the international health regulations. So the, um, it remains the only set of regulations that has a global application. It's widely agreed and certified by the entire 194 member states of the WHO. 
but uh, what part of the problem with the IHR is that uh, most of the countries, as well as the developing countries, um, don't have the core capacity um, you know, for surveillance you know, that is required by the regulations. Um, so, you know, uh, they need a lot of help in terms of developing the health systems to be able to respond effectively to emerging and re-emerging uh, infectious diseases. Um, it remains to be seen, you know, what will happen next. You know, epidemics come and go. Uh, it's um, a matter of time when we, we have some, you know, another um, global epidemic or pandemic. So, um, my view on this is that there's nothing wrong with the, the regulations as it is, but you know there's a lot of things wrong with the way it is enforced. So often, um, you know, the global um, scientific community, you know, um, and especially these um, imagine and reimagine uh, uh, um, um, uh, disease events, um, they, they, at the rate at which they, they, they occur, you know, the regulations and the laws are you know very slow. They don't keep pace with these events. So I think, um, um, in a nutshell, I think it's a, it's a question of how to enforce the IHR in a proactive way. Thank you. Uh, I suppose it's also worth thinking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and where pandemics fit in there, and they're kind of there's bits and pieces here and there that are relevant, but in terms of pandemic management, I don't think there's sort of a cohesive um, single goal. And what's changed uh, in, this, in the landscape? Well, you might have seen a film called Gattaca about 20 years ago, which you know, was about perfectly uh, engineered human beings and a society of superhuman beings who are engineered to perfection. If you're born naturally, you're an underclass. Uh, in the last three years, there's been a very radical new technology called CRISPR-Cas9, which is a precise gene editing tool that's very um, accessible. It essentially means you can edit anything, human embryos, um, plants, animals, viruses, bacteria. You can eradicate species. You can bypass Mendelian inheritance. Uh, editing of human embryos is already happening in Sweden. The director of national intelligence in the US last year called CRISPR-Cas9 a weapon of mass destruction because I think he recognized the um, ap applicability to pathogens. There's a story about a SARS version two virus in, uh, created in a lab. And of course, do-it-yourself biology is an emerging trend. There's labs in Sydney, in San Francisco, in New York, everywhere, uh, with the philosophy being that anyone should be able to do science and you know, it should be open to experimentation. So there is you know, a range of different factors that create this perfect storm for biosecurity. I think uh, you know the key points are that infections can't be contained within geographic borders. Travel and globalization mean that an infection spreads very rapidly around the world. We have had quantum advances in science and accessibility of scientific methods that impact this, um, and global oversight is required in terms of governance, legal, ethical, and research conduct. But we have vertical systems. We've got vertical systems of critical stakeholders, health, law enforcement, military, emergency management. We tried to show some of the conflict between agencies that always occurs during these kind of events, as well as animal health, agriculture, and food. And our current global systems are not well equipped to deal with these kind of events, as we've seen over and over again. So the nature of pandemics, they are a type of natural disaster. They cause acute perturbations to systems. They have immediate health, social, and economic impacts, and you need global solutions to deal with them. The impacts, of course, are worse where the baseline systems are weak, as we saw in West Africa with Ebola, and they generally require complex cross-sectoral responses. But inter intersectoral collaboration can be challenging and can undermine those responses. And time and time again, we see that failures in epidemic response are not biomedical failures or failures in technical expertise. There's plenty of experts who flood to these epidemics, you know? You get kind of a peak in publications when epidemics occur. It's due to systems failures, you know? It's system failures that derail things. So the dimensions of response to epidemic are complex. They include your basic emergency response, surge capacity, command and control systems, your epidemiologic investigation, crisis communications, 
Uh, public health and other legislation, your pharmaceutical interventions are just one small part, and then your non-pharmaceutical interventions, managing your stockpiles, prioritising, protecting your first-line responders. Lessons learned are many. You know, how do we create this uh, cycling between surge capacity and business as usual? How do we have clear command and control structures? How do we sort out the role of different disease control measures and objectives and how we time those uh, to be the most effective, like closing your schools, you know, it's got to be done early. And how do you resolve conflict and work better across sectors and deal with these, uh, and how do you deal with the conspiracy theorists who are always out there, whether it's at, you know, baseline times, the anti-vaccine lobby, for example, or in crises, they tend to peak in activity as well. Now, communication is really key. Internal communication within your teams, but also external communication, both with health professionals and the community. Keeping messages consistent. Hotlines can be used for case finding and contact tracing and getting really important public health messages out there. Um, for example, during the Ebola epidemic in Australia, initially the College of General Practice put out a, a, a release saying, if you think you have Ebola, go to your GP. Now that is not a great idea. It's better to have a few limited centres of treatment and that was then withdrawn after people fed back. Uh, but you know that kind of message can result in a bad outcome or a good outcome depending on what the message is. And the media of course is really important. It can be an ally or it can be an enemy. You can spread important public health messages using the media but the media can also keep public health professionals honest and um, keep us on our toes. So learning to engage with the media is really key. Then we challenged him about whether the CDC's protocols were adequate. You would go into you a, an infected risk. Ebola patient's room without covering your head, with only wearing one pair of gloves and with your feet exposed, you would do that? Absolutely. More is not always better. Better is better. More is not always better. Well, today we got a picture of Dr. Frieden visiting an Ebola ward in Liberia. Look at him there. That's him front and center. He is covered head to toe and is double gloved. Clearly, in this case, more is better. Absolutely. More is not always better. Better is better. So the point about that um, interview is that none of us ever wants to be in that kind of interview. And some of the tricks to dealing with, often it's about uncertainty. You know, and one of the key lessons is never to communicate scientific uncertainty as certainty to your minister, to the press, to anyone. You know, the minister depends on their advisor, and if the advisor gives them the wrong message, they end up looking stupid. Um, and uh, sometimes it's okay to say we don't know. You know, this is uncertain. And I think generally the research shows that the public doesn't mind. They actually can feel reassured to hear experts saying we don't know. So the recovery then, there's a range of um, strategies, winding back your surge capacity, returning to business as usual, prioritising your suspended operations for you know, restarting. Public-private partnerships are really important. They can be quite critical in helping rebuild a society, resourcing and communication. So in summary, we are seeing an increasing frequency of serious epidemics globally. That's real. And you know these things spread around the world very rapidly. There are many stakeholders, many sectors, and a health-centric response is just not adequate. If you look at any pandemic plan anywhere in the world, it's health-centric. You know it doesn't consider other sectors. But you know when when we get to phase SHTF, everyone needs to band together and work in these situations. Um, so I think we've highlighted you know that that we do have inadequate global legal and regulatory frameworks which are a threat to biosecurity and that public health needs to adapt to this new reality. We can't live in the past thinking the way we did it 20 years ago is still the same effectiveness. So I'd like to thank a bunch of people behind the scenes who helped us to put all this stuff together as well as some of the resources we've drawn on uh, for the exercise. And I'm going to hand over to Dylan who's hopefully going to resurrect those questions and give out the rest of the prizes. So thanks very much. Oh, also uh, this disclaimer, you know, this is completely fictitious. 
uh, no, um, you know, identification with any actual persons, places, buildings, etc., should not be inferred, and uh, unauthorized exhibition, distribution, or copying is prohibited. So, can everyone see the questions now, or it is a bit small? Read them out. Can yeah. Just read out number. Oh, it's changing. All right. So we've got, is the virus affecting a certain demographic? I think that was down the front. Um, at what stage will health concerns outweigh economic concerns? What kind of testing do you have? So uh, that was um, directed towards Bilski. Uh, you know, we're running out of PPE. What, what's the stockpile of antivirals look like? I think a very popular question to the left was, uh, there's a lot of inaction happening on the panel, so what are you doing about the gender balance? So which was first on that one? So at the moment, running out of PPE looks to be winning. Okay, who was that? Okay, Chow? There's Chow? Hmm. She's already had oh, one. you already had one? Okay. Maybe we'll give it to the second question then. So second and third, Chow? what kind of Chow? testing do you have? And I think a good one, at what stage will health concerns outweigh economic okay. concerns? And you have the USB? <laughs> There's also an opportunity to ask questions of any of the panelists if you'd like in the last few minutes. If anyone has any questions? Yeah. I can just move on to the next um, question. This is actually a pretty practical question. Uh, it looks like a lot of work has gone into developing all of these resources, but presumably the 10 of you don't get together that often and roll this out. Um, I assume you're all really busy with other things. So what opportunity is there to uh, use those resources for, say, teaching purposes or training? Yeah, we are intending to put together a package for um, teaching and training purposes, so this will be available in a slightly different format. Yeah. And some of the material in here is already drawn from teaching material such as the movie Pandemic. Okay, next question. Yeah. So this will just be a review of the slides we went through at the start. Okay. So, yeah. Thermo scanners are popular because um, you know, politicians want to be seen to be doing something, and uh, it's an intervention that can be implemented. But for, for some diseases, it's okay, but for flu, it's just not effective. Didn't capture the other press conferences. Okay. Um, who, who asked questions again? Who didn't get a prize? Okay, we've got three people and we've got two prizes left. <gasps> decisions, decisions. Chow, you're going to have to just give them out. Yeah, yeah who yeah, asked the so. where's the women? That's awesome. That's awesome. Other people, uh, do we have another prize left, Chow? Yeah. Okay, I think. Yeah. I think she deserves a prize. She asked yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah. Thanks very much. You've been a great audience and a great yeah. press gallery.